it's it's hard, but you've got some people that can help you, right? Whether it's me or other people, they can help you make these fundamental shifts and changes. And then believe me, after you know six months of of hard work, the rest of it becomes so much easier. It's easier to sell, and it's easier for someone to come in and run it. Welcome to the Agency Profit Podcast a show dedicated to going deep space on agency operations, which is just as nerdy as it sounds. I'm your host, Marcel Petipoff. I'm the CEO of Parakeeto, a firm that helps digital and creative agencies measure and improve their profitability. Join me as I interview some of the smartest thought leaders and agency owners in our space and go deep into operations, metrics, and all the other things you need to get right so you can spend less time worrying about operations and more time executing on your vision. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Agency Profit Podcast. I'm very excited today to be joined by an industry veteran. This is somebody that you know had an 18-year career with Coca-Cola, then started his own cloud consulting businesses, built that, scaled it, sold it, and has spent the last several years helping other cloud consultants really understand and optimize their business. And he's here today to nerd out about business models. So with that, Paul Higgins, thanks so much for joining us today. I'll bring you to be here, myself. Uh, We had a really great interview on your show and of course, I'm really excited to now have you come on to our show. And what's really funny, we're chatting before this episode, several of your clients have actually been guests on our show, which I I didn't know until recently. So we had Greg Hickman, uh, we had uh, Juliana, I think you'd mentioned a couple other ones, Brad Ferris, maybe that uh, has been a client of yours. So you've been in the game for a long time and uh, I'd love to give you an opportunity in your own words to share a little bit more about what you do and who you serve. Yeah, brilliant. Well, look, I help cloud consultants, as you said, but also agency owners. And I help them to scale to exit. And exit can really take two forms. One is that they do exit the business like um, we did, where they sell the business. Or the other option normally is that they get someone in to run it, but they're actually exiting themselves out of being the key factor in earning their cash flow and their profit. So that's what I love to do. Awesome. Well, I'm happy that you're here and uh, we're going to dive into a topic that is very near and dear to my heart that I don't think gets discussed enough, which is the nuances of this business model. And I love that you have applied this to agencies, but also like lots of other different types of consulting and service businesses in kind of the IT and digital space over the years. So we can kind of abstract this away because I think you and I both know when when you look under the hood, all service businesses are essentially the same. The, The layer that's nuances, of course, what we have that, that little thin layer we apply to the top, which is what services we sell, you know, building and selling some businesses and now getting into coaching others, you've developed a, a three part framework that is, you know, really central to how you view service businesses and, and what needs to be in place for them to scale. Could you share a little bit more about that three part framework uh, of which we're going to dive into one section in particular today? Yeah. And, and look, it's really come about from my own experience, right? We, you know, we got one agency or one consulting business that went really poorly and one that went well. So quickly, the one that went poor was uh, we picked Podio, which was a project management platform, and we're helping agency owners with that. And it was great. We built a large team in the Philippines. Everything's going well. But then Citrix bought the company, and due to my corporate background, I went to one meeting in Copenhagen in Denmark and realised that this is not going to be successful. So we sort of pulled the pin on that. And that was, you know, that was really, really difficult because we'd spent five years building this business up, you know, thought we had everything structured. And then we went agnostic for a while and then we ended up realising that that was too complicated. You know, all things, we were still on only focusing on agencies, but it was like all platforms and it was just too difficult to train. Every time you sold, it was slightly different, et cetera. And then uh, finally, we doubled down on two key platforms. One was Copper, which is a sales CRM, and the other was Mavenlink, which and Asana. So really, three, and did that for agencies and um, sold out to a Google partner. So why I'm saying that is all of that learned experience of things that worked really well and things that didn't is sort of what I've put into a blueprint and uh, what I help people with now. And uh, it's really got three key sections. One is optimize your, your business model. The second is uh, a, a sales and marketing engine. And the third is a high performing team, which sound pretty uh, basic and common. They are, but actually doing it is where the complexity lies. 
<laughs> awesome. And of course, yeah, all three of those things, very important. And I wish we had time to dig into all of them. But the one I want to spend some time on today is the one that I don't think gets enough attention, which is really digging into the business model and how to think through identifying the right business model for your agency. Because I think a lot of people just see the agency as being a straightforward thing in terms of its business model. But you and I both know that there's a lot of nuances here and there are a lot of different things that you can do to move the business in one direction or another. And it influences things like how you price and how you scope and how you structure teams. And so uh, really excited to, to double click on that. Um, so why don't we start at, at the basic uh, level, which is, you know, how, how would you define a business model for the purpose of this conversation today? Yeah, great. Well, I've, I've broken it up into three key sections. So one is your specialised niche, right? So I believe that uh, the further your niche or niche down, uh, the easier it is to build a successful agency. That's just uh, the way that uh, we've done it. Now, it it depends on what type of agency, right? So the agencies that we um, typically help are more HubSpot agencies and there's a, an element of consulting and services, right? And some have developed product as well, but I'll, I'll come back to that. So I think that's the first one. The second is around uh, your optimizing your offer, right? Because the easier you get your offer, and if you make it irresistible, the easier it's going to be to sell it, right? So why try to make something complicated and then sell? Make it as easy as possible. And then the last one is around that client satisfaction. It's It's around really understanding how someone's, currently buying things which once again then you can do the sales and marketing so often you know people look at tactics and quickly go into it and you know uh, each time I've worked with someone and we've spent time in this area it's made a, a seismic change in their business right and most people you know if I can tweak your sales etc look it might make a you know a five percent margin or a two percent margin gain but if I can fundamentally change the way that you go to market and get the business model right, then you can make, you know, big changes in your profit and your margins. So that's why we always believe and it. And it sort of came out a bit of Franklin Covey, right? I'm sure you've probably heard about, you know, seven habits of highly effective people. And he says, always start with the end in mind. And fortunately at Coca-Cola, you know, it was a company that had been around for 150 years and, you know, it was a great, it had the great ability to set like a 10, 15 year plan and really look at things strategically before they went into the execution. So, you know, once again, I've taken all those skills and learnings and applied it into this area. So uh, three very interesting pillars, I suppose we'll start with the first one, which is a specialized niche. And I think, uh, you know, we've talked about niching many, many times on the show before. It's a very yeah. popular topic in the agency space. And, and for good reason, uh, from my perspective, uh, this is a big part of the way that the services space, especially industries, have responded to a massive increase in pressure on their margins over the last few years is, is getting much more specialized and trying to reap all the benefits that that creates, both from, you know, ideally being perceived as more valuable as well as being able to streamline their operations in the back end. When you think about niching, what are some of the core tenets that uh, that you think feel are important in understanding, A, what a niche is and then how to identify one for your business? Yeah, look, I think the um, what I normally do is working with people is say, well, where have you already got some experience, right? So most people, you know, you might have already come from corporate. You've got a certain industry background that you've already come from. So if if you've got that, let's use that as the first point, right? Because you've got a network, you understand the language. There's a lot of benefits you've got. So why don't we start there? So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is who in your network can you go out and research, right, interview and research to really find out what the pain points are. And we've all heard, you know, that iceberg where, you know, people will tell you why they're not successful or why they're not achieving their goals and, you know, they'll start at the surface, right? But how do you really use the five eyes and really dig into what are their pain points? Because when someone comes to your LinkedIn profile, they come to your website, you know, you want that experience that they say, oh, thank goodness, someone finally really gets me, right? I've been looking everywhere for you. Thank God you're there. And that's, what you want your clients or customers to, to feel when they come to you, right? So doing that pain point identification, as I call it, and really digging into that is, uh, and then you go and validate it, right? Like how can you actually start to test? And that's where we, you know, LinkedIn is, is fantastic because you can go and find these people 
and then you can actually start to do some testing to see if what your profile and what your your research has told you is actually working in the market. Hmm. I, I love that you, you know, the central tenant here of the niche is, is figuring out the problems that a particular set of people have and really deeply understanding that problem. I think this is the most overlooked aspect of choosing a niche. And to me, it's the most important because all of these other things that people think about in terms of niching uh, of like, what's the vertical and the industry and the size of the company and the, you know, are we Facebook? Are we HubSpot? Are we this service or that service? All of those things feel secondary um, to really understanding, well, what problem do we solve? And then why do those things make sense as the new or innovative or unique solution that we bring to the table that solves that problem uh, better than anyone else? So I love that as like the, the core tenant here is identifying that problem in the niche. Yeah, and then it's probably, you know, not not complimentary to me because I actually can grow my hair. I know you have a great head of hair uh, and, and a great beard there, Marcel, but for me, uh, I can grow, but I just choose not to, right? Um, so I shave it off. But I say to people, what's your client's hair on fire problem, right? What do they absolutely have to put out? And people, you know, I'll, I'll, we have an ideal client profile. You can go to paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash ICP. So it's a really good profile. And people give me, you know, they, they give me what they think I want to hear as a, as a coach, right, or as a mentor. But I'm like, no, I, I want you to really pick that that key pain point that someone has to solve. Otherwise, they won't be able to scale. And, um, yeah, I think once you get to that level of depth and understanding, then everything else becomes easy because then you can create an offer to actually solve it. Hey, it's Marcel here, and I hope you're enjoying the episode so far. If you are, then I want to encourage you to check out the Agency Profitability Toolkit. It's a free set of resources that we've put together to help agency owners just like you improve their profitability. It's full of free checklists, templates, and training videos, and has helped thousands of agencies get better at measuring the essentials of their business. So if you want to grab a free copy of that, you can head to paracuto.com forward slash toolkit or look for a link wherever you're watching or listening to this. With that, I want to thank you again for tuning in, and I'll let you get back to the episode. So let's move on to then that second tenant, which is offer design. So assuming that you've, you know, you've been able to really land on a core problem that somebody is experiencing, and you've done that to your point through like high quality interactions, interviews, um, discussing these things with people really in doing proper customer development, which I'll leave a link to, you know, one of my favorite books in the show notes, which is lean customer development. There's another great one, which is the jobs to be done framework, some, some great resources on how to do that process. But yes. once you've been led to the problem, how do we then go about building the offer? Yeah, look, I think the, the first thing is always look at what your current pricing Right. So before we go too far into like let's change in this model, we've got to you've got to a fund additional people like me to come in, and you've also got to fund some of the changes. So what you know, let's look at your value pricing. And I know when you were on my podcast, which you can you know find up at, at my website, um, you did a brilliant job in articulating value pricing. Right. And I think it's so important to get to value pricing. And and what do I mean by value pricing? It's where you know. You look at, well, what's the absolute gain that you're going to get on this? And, and it doesn't have to be exact, right? It can be a ballpark. And then I always say, look, I'll take 10% of that. You keep 90, right? So, and I think that's easy for people. People are reasonable and they'll sort of understand that. So instead of charging by the hours, charging by time, you know, how can you go to your existing clients and say, well, what is the upside of this? And, and if you can't get all that way, I still think most people under, um, we all, including myself, don't charge what we're worth, right? So even if it's not by 10% of the upside, it at least is charging uh, what, what you what you are actually worth. And I think that's then fun, some of the other model changes. Hmm. So, yeah, of course, you know, most agencies uh, could stand to improve their pricing. And uh, as you mentioned, you know, we, we went fairly deep on your show about, like how to consider the different um, pricing models. And I, I certainly think paying more attention to value is an important one. There's another aspect to this though, that, you know, we, we should probably talk about, which is risk. Um, yeah. Because, you know, I think if we're taking a truly uh, problem-based approach to identifying our niche and then identifying how we're going to solve that problem, we might land on a solution that is not 
easy to package, you know, is not cookie cutter. It, it, it might very well be. And I think it should be that sometimes the way that we solve problems for clients is, is very complex and it's not very yes. predictable. And so how do we adapt um, our business model to be able to handle that uncertainty um, versus, you know, the other scenario, which could very well be true, where there is a very predictable and packaged and clear solution that we can then value price on top of. Because I think um, I love value based pricing, but people get caught up in that and sometimes try to apply it to services that are actually innately unpredictable, which yes, is part of yes. what makes them so potent for particular problem solving. Yeah. Well, it goes back to number one, right? If you're doing more of like clients, you've got more examples that then de-risks the situation, right? So I think that's why it's so important to first get your niche, your niche right. And then when you go to someone and say, hey, look, you know, well, when I worked with five other people exactly like you with the same problem, this is what I did, right? And when you can show them that, all of a sudden they're like, oh, okay, well, this is not like a lot of other people I've spoken to that said, you know, loosely I could help you well you can get the sense when someone's like trying to change the sales conversation to meet the, the their need to get your business right well this isn't the case so I think that definitely helps and I think that's the biggest way to do risk it is actually have more examples like them yeah yeah and, and of course that comes down to de-risking for for the client so let's talk about some of those aspects i think those are really important right is like what makes a, an offer attractive to the client what are those key elements yeah, look, I think the um, I recently had, um, and I've got a mental blank, so I'll, I'll uh, it'll come to me in a moment. But someone that wrote the Challenger book, and now he's written uh, another book called The Jolt Effect, right? And he's saying that most sales don't go through because of indecision, right? So we always think that we're losing the competitor, or we're losing it because we didn't price it right, etc. But it's actually indecision that is mainly causing the change so if you can have an offer that helps to overcome that in, um, indecision that's when you're going to really uh, win and and like you said most people it's more the point of well if if I make a decision and this decision's wrong this is going to actually harm my reputation in the business especially if you're working with larger organizations and you you know you're really dealing with people's careers here when you're implementing solutions it's you know that's the key thing so in the irresistible offer you make sure that you address what you believe are those key risk points that that they've got um i know that's sort of a little bit as a summary and then i can get into more specifics but ultimately that's what it is right because remember put yourself in the shoes of the person that's buying it and they've they've got some inherent risk that don't seem obvious right and uh, I know that when we used to sell some solutions that weren't the sales force, they weren't the, you know, the um, large Microsoft, the large brands, people as a, you know, let's say you're dealing with um, someone in IT and, you know, it's their career on the line if this goes south and how do they trust you as a small business? And sometimes you'll be a small agency going up bigger players and you've got to get around the fact is, well, why would they take a risk with you being a smaller player rather than taking the big guys? And it's easy to say, well, I didn't know the big guys were going to get it wrong, right? But if a smaller agency where you've backed yourself to take it on, that's harder. So I think that's the stuff you've really got to get to in the uh, irresistible offer. Yeah. Yeah. Th these are two great points. It's something we say all the time as well, right? So your biggest competitor is usually what they're already doing <laughs> or them doing nothing at all. And uh, it, you're totally right. A lot of times the client will start to perceive making a decision as riskier than making no decision at all. So it's about de-risking the decision while also, to your point, drawing the contrast, right? To like really digging in and setting an anchor around, look at what it's costing you, look at the pain that you know, you're feeling by currently being in this situation and then look at how much upside there is here and client test of course client case studies and previous examples of work are one of the most potent ways of of de-risking that future outcome that you're trying to draw the client towards yeah, um, and, and and then and, there's other there's other things when you're you're billing on value that i think are important here which is like that when you start if you are in a position where you're able to start billing on value 
then the time to the outcome becomes an interesting one because now that you're not selling time, if you can actually get them to that faster, that increases the value in many ways as well, which is like a a paradigm shift for a lot of people that have come from a world of, of selling time and billable hours where the speed at which you got them to an outcome was not necessarily a lever you were looking to pull. But if you can imagine selling on value, it might actually be more expensive to get a deliverable to the client quicker rather than less expensive because you're not anchoring that price of time. So there's other ways to kind of think about this value axis as well, which I think is fascinating. Yeah. And then, you know, I don't know if you've heard the story about that, you know, the plumber and the leaky tap right you know it's been told so many times but you know i always look at it as you know someone comes says you know i've got this problem he goes okay i can fix it it's twenty thousand dollars and the person's like well you're gonna take how long is it gonna take you to fix he goes half an hour and he says well twenty thousand dollars for a half an hour he goes well what's the opportunity cost if i don't fix it right so what's it costing you at the moment not to fix it and the person's like, oh, okay, yeah, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? And then they say, well, how can you justify $20,000? Because I'm the only person that knows how to fix that leak, and I've done it so many times, I can guarantee you that I know how to fix it, right? But what's your other options? You don't really have another option, right? So I think $20,000 of, you know, potentially looking at a $500,000 problem here is, is, is fair game. And I think that's what you end up doing by having, you know, the same – the same case, like you said, case studies of similar clients with similar problems, right? Then you can actually start to price better on the on the value, and it's your experience that people are buying. You know, you don't go into when someone electrician comes and they got to, you know, your powers out and they're going to solve it. You don't say, well, give me a cost breakdown of every item that you're going to do and how long you're going to spend it. What are you just like solve my problem? You know, like that's and it's a similar thing that we need to get to with the irresistible offers for agency owners like yourself. I want to uh, also just draw a contrast here where some of you might be listening to this and thinking, well, I don't sell to (laughs) big businesses. I sell to small businesses with small budgets and they're very cost conscious. Or, you know, I'm in a commoditized service, like straight up, I'd sell pretty generic stuff. um, And this may not sound like it applies to you. And I think there are elements of it that certainly do, but also I think it's worth acknowledging that, you know, these, these concepts do not apply to everyone. The assumptions here are that you can scope the work and that there is, you know, some kind of value conversation to arbitrage. And if there is, these are probably the right mechanics to be employing, but there is also, of course, going to be a market for and a need for people to do low value work that is commoditized for small businesses that don't have big budgets and work that's very high risk that that cannot be scoped or the way you have to deliver it also cannot be scoped. You, you have to sell time, in which case you got to consider that when you design the business model and figure out how to adjust your, your business model to share risk or to make sure that you're at the end of the day, your margins are still healthy. So uh, understand on. that like you know, you you have to consider how much value is there. And this changes, right? This is the interesting thing. Like what you just mentioned, if a plumber comes to my house and charges me $20,000 to fix my leaky tap, I'm I'm just not willing to pay that because it's not costing me that much money. I, I have three other sinks in the house, you know, I'm not, but if I'm running a business and like, so the con, the con, text for the client matters significantly. And so you, you might have this experience in your own agency where it's like, it depends who's sitting on the other end of the phone. It, it might not necessarily be inherent about the service, but it's about the context. Yeah. And, and I think you've summed up like, um, sunk costs, right? So, you know, I get lots of clients that are saying, well, yeah, I do sell, uh, high volume, low ticket margins. You know, I'm constantly competing on price. I'm like, well, we've got to change who you service, right? Because, uh, Coke used to always say, you might as there's someone that needs to be the most expensive in your industry, it might as well be you, right? So yes, I'm not about high volume, low value, right? I'm, I'm more of let's, you know, if you specialize and you actually solve someone's problem, right, that you can charge the fair price, that's why we do the business model first, right? And it and it may mean a change. So, for, you know, the first six months is going to be painful because you are migrating away from what you're doing, but then it becomes so much easier to do the other elements, right? And that's why I think, you know, we're talking here to say start with the business model first. And just because you've always been in a particular model or you've always sold in a particular way doesn't mean it has to stay that way. Yeah. 
Yeah, I completely agree. It's not to say that uh, those other business models don't work, but they're not nearly as easy. Um, you got to be really, really on top of your stuff if you're going to outcompete somebody in terms of efficiency. Uh, it's a totally different ball game than, to your point, improving your positioning, moving to a higher value situation, and, and just improving your margins it makes everything more forgiving. So that leads us into the last piece, right, which is about that that customer and who you serve and how that changes the dynamics of the business model. So let's dig into that last one. Yeah. And, and, and just very quickly, I'll just, the other key component is, you know, the recurring revenue model, right? Everyone talks about it, so I won't labor on it, but you know, if you can get a form of recurring revenue and the sort of three key things is normally you're consulting, you got your services. And then if you can sell a product on top of that, right, they're the sort of the three pillars to, to revenue or three legs to the stool. And if you can get to more recurring, obviously that's much better for you. And it's also much better if you do sell the business, right, because it's easier to value something that's recurring rather than project-based. But if we now look at the third one, which is, like you said, the client satisfaction, I think it's really important to buy the, um, map that buyer's journey. Right, So so often we look at our sales process and we look at it from the way that we sell. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to do a, a, you know, a, a first call, a discovery call, I'm going to do a second call, I'm going to do a proposal, et cetera. And that's, that's fine, but it's like, well, how actually is someone buying this? So let's flip it. And I don't know if you've heard of Andy Paul, but he's got a great um, podcast and he often talks about this, is like map it out from how the person's actually buying it. So what's an example? It's like, well, you know, normally, and you've, you know, the consideration model, right, where they first have got to, you know, actually uh, understand that they've got the problem, then they've got to look for options as to how they're trying to solve that problem, and then, you know, they go and pick the, the person. So where are they in that buyer's journey, and how do you set up the assets that you provide to help them during uh, through that journey. I think that is so powerful if you get that right. Whereas, you know, most of us, including myself, until I realised that was effectively just taking people through my sales gate, right? Not actually factoring it for the way that they actually buy. Yeah, this is one that I love and has been transformative for us as well is really getting clear on, you know, what is our point of view on the problem and how it should be solved and kind of helping um, people that engage with us in the sales conversation understand like our point of view on how this should be solved that has nothing to do necessarily with our business, of course. We, we try to solve the problem in that way, but it gives them a, like some criteria to evaluate the other solutions against. And of course, the trick is you could bias this <laughs> towards what you do, but it really is a, a, an incredibly powerful thing that makes the sales conversation so much more consultative and helpful so that um, the client leaves the call, whether they buy from you or not, feeling like they learned something. And yeah. oftentimes that, that comes back in terms of conversion in my experience. Yeah, and then, you know, if you all picture a desk, right, you don't want someone sitting opposite you, you want someone sitting uh, alongside you, right? And the more that you can, and this is where it goes back, and I'm sort of, you know, I know I've spoken about it a lot, but once you really understand a niche or a niche and you know it so well, you can then sit on the same side as them. And it's, you know, and I'll often say to someone, look, hey, I don't think you're right for me right? It's, you know, we've, we've looked through, we've done the diagnostic, but what you want to achieve and what you're looking for is not right for me, but I'm happy to actually recommend three people to you. And if you want to come back to me and ask me once you've met with them, that's fine because I've really got you in my best interest, right? And that's where I'm going through the buyer's journey rather than the, the sellers. And I think, you know, that, that can make a fundamental change and you've probably heard it before, right? But have you actually gone and implemented it? And I really challenge you to go and implement that and see what difference it's going to make. Now, this is, it's great because everything you've talked about, you know, these are all things that, that we have personally kind of embodied uh, at Parakeeto. And I can, I can personally speak to the impact of all three of these things. Like clearly we've got a niche. We've really been thoughtful about our offer and our business model. And this is definitely the way that we sell. We, we turn away far more people than we work with. Um, and I'll pre I, I'm going to plant the seed for the other things that we didn't have time to talk about today, but you have some great resources on, which is I only get to do this because we have way more people trying to work with us than we have capacity for. So I can really go into every sales call and from the bottom of my heart, not care if that person becomes a client and just say, I'm here to help you figure out if we can be helpful or not and point you in the right direction. And it's, it's genuine because of the excess of demand that we have. So 
that is a, a really powerful foundation to embody these principles on top of. So for those that want to go and consume some of the other content that you put together on the rest of this framework and, and how to get that kind of demand, and then of course, you know, optimize the rest of the business uh, in terms of building high performance teams, where can they go to find that stuff? Yeah, so they can go to paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash blueprint. And I've got an ebook that sort of takes you through all of these three sections and then the sub components under it. And what I say to people and I say to you is just take it and have a look at what you've got, right? Because, you know, for me, like I said, I've gone through the journey of, of you know, I worked with agencies when I was at Coca-Cola. Then we went and, you know, serviced your industry so I know a lot about that and the principles I learned there apply and just see what you've got if you've got it all that's brilliant right but if you're listening to this and you think there's gaps well that document will actually help you identify those gaps and then you can look for ways to to go and solve them well with that we're going to leave in the show notes links to Paul's website we'll also leave links to the resources that were mentioned earlier including the ICP um, resource some customer development resources and links to his show as well um, Paul you create some fantastic content and I, I commend you for it um, I'm glad that you're out there spreading the gospel of, of good business practices uh, for those that uh, have enjoyed the show today any final words of advice before we part ways yeah look I think it's Hard things are hard for a reason, right? So if if you feel like you're trapped and, you know, it, it just feels like Groundhog Day every day, like, you know, it's, it's hard, but you've got some people that can help you, right? Whether it's me or other people, they can help you make these fundamental shifts and changes. And then believe me, after, you know, six months of, of hard work, the rest of it becomes so much easier. It's easier to sell and it's easier for someone to come in and run it. Very wise words. It's hard for a reason. <laughs> a reminder, I think we all need sometimes at, at various stages of the journey. Well, with all that, Paul, um, I'm going to encourage everyone to go and check out the, the great content that you've been producing uh, and more of the thought leadership you have around this framework. I can't thank you enough for making the time to be here with us. It was a real pleasure. And uh, I look forward to our next chat. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks a lot, Marcel.